<laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, um, it is a great pleasure to be in Zagreb, and I want to extend thanks once again to David Al-Bahari, uh, who has uh, been instrumental in, in my being here. This invitation has uh, been most welcome. I am only here for a few days. I leave tomorrow, but it has been uh, a, an enriching experience, and I'm very happy to be here tonight at MAMA to uh, talk about this topic, uh, happiness upgrade anxiety and the post-human condition. Uh, I should say at the outset that this talk is a kind of postscript or update to a book I published on happiness now almost 20 years ago, 18 years ago, uh, called uh, In Pursuit of Happiness, Better Living from Plato to Prozac. Uh, and this book was a uh, philosophical attempt to understand the machinery of happiness as it emerged in late capitalist life, uh, especially in uh, Europe and North American culture of individual satisfaction. So while the book traced the historical mutations of the idea of happiness, its critical focus was in specific the ways in which the idea of happiness had become a kind of colonizing imperative in the sense of self that we each experience in the late 20th and now early 21st century. And so this talk tonight uh, is, is uh, almost two decades later, a, a really an extension of the same critical analysis with respect to the idea of happiness. In particular, I want to focus uh, in these remarks on the notion of the post-human condition and uh, the, what, I, what was quoted as the emerging logic of the post-human. And I, I will try to understand what I, underst uh, I understand that notion of post-human to mean. And we can talk in, in the discussion afterwards uh, about your own insights. Um, so let me start um, by just offering uh, one image. Uh, there are many images, but this image is the, if you like, the keynote image. The selfie in time, as I call it, the selfie in time. Uh, you will recognize my countryman, uh, Justin Bieber. Uh, that's really. No, no, really? No. Well, that's Justin Bieber, my, my, my fellow Canadian. I should, I should say my fellow Canadian, but also, weirdly enough, Justin Bieber and I have the same birthday. <laughs> we, were, we were both born on, on March 1st, 1st of March. Uh, of course, he's considerably younger than I am. Uh, but we, we celebrate our birthdays together, and whenever I see my horoscope on my birthday, underneath it says, also born on this date, Justin Bieber. Uh, so here's Justin Bieber uh, giving a concert in Toronto last year. And the reason I, I like this image is probably obvious when you look at it. Uh, I'm going to use my little uh, uh, didactic laser. Uh, but look, look at the experience of the Justin Bieber concert as it is mediated by the people who are attending. Uh, there is something, it seems to me, very significant, even though also very obvious, about this kind of scenario, where the people attending the concert <clears throat> allegedly or putatively there to see, hear Justin Bieber are already always filtering, sorry, it's too loud, filtering their experience uh, through the, the uh, capture of images. And in fact, my, my favorite is, li there's little Justin right there. There's a <laughs> little homunculus Justin Bieber um, captured beautifully. Uh, I mean, this, as I say, is so obvious. But w one thing that maybe is not so obvious about the capture of images as a substitute for experience, direct or unmediated experience, is the temporal dimension. And I, I want to kind of offer this as a keynote because I think this temporal aspect of our engagement with technology is, is insufficiently appreciated. What is the point of taking these pictures? It's not to dilute the experience. It is rather to post the experience later. So these images, which are being captured by the, the phones, will presumably end up or have already uh, on Instagram feeds or Facebook uh, updates uh, and so on. And the idea, it seems to me, is that the moment that is here captured is actually not happening here. This is a simulacral moment. Uh, it is actually being postponed. In fact, infinitely postponed to some uh, future time at which we, what? Uh, share the image, recapture the image, uh, or something. But there, there's a gap here in terms of the self that I think uh, is not uh, completely understood in terms of our immersion, uh, as I'm going to describe it, our cyborg condition in respect of technology. 
Let me give you a very quick overview of, of the remarks I will offer tonight. First, I'm going to talk about the four traditional solutions to the question of, of how one can be happy. And these are all easily recognizable in the philosophical uh, tradition in the West of the last couple of centuries. Uh, then I'm going to talk about the difference between human and post-human. Then I'm going to understand or, or analyze the notion of upgrade anxiety, which I think is intimately connected, in fact, inextricably connected to our immersion in technology. I'm going to then isolate what I call the happiness imperative, which I think is a feature of that upgrade imperative uh, and anxiety. And um, after that, I'm going to uh, offer very brief uh, suggestions for what might be done or what might be thought about this condition, but then really open it up to discussion. So let's look briefly at these four <coughs> traditional Western ideas of how we ought to be happy. The first, um, and you know, none of these is more obvious than the others, and they all relate to each other. So I'm, I'm, I'm p pulling a, a, apart strands of a narrative here. Uh, I think the narrative will be familiar. Uh, one of the most powerful narratives of human happiness in the, in the modern age in the West comes from Rousseau, the idea of freedom. Man was born free and everywhere is in, slave, in, in change. Uh, so the, the opening salvo of Rousseau's social contract is a claim about a natural condition of freedom which is everywhere constrained or uh, narrowed by social conventions and interpersonal relations that somehow make us less free. Uh, Rousseau's idea, of course, is that we need to recapture, uh, revisit the natural condition and reinvigorate, rediscover the freedom which is naturally ours. And only by doing that will we be able to fulfill ourselves completely as humans. This is a very romantic notion of the human existence and why the natural condition is one that we need to return to again and again. So the contrast implicit here between all of the aspects of the social, which are negative uh, in effect, and the positive aspects of the natural, the thing to which we return. Uh, you might characterize this as a kind of Edenic uh, or prelapsarian notion of human happiness. Second, uh, again, these are not necessarily separable in, in real life, but are separable in uh, abstract intellectual terms. Marx's notion of, of non-alienated labor. The route to happiness on this account is to recapture or appreciate uh, our fundamental nature as laborers and to appreciate, furthermore, how in most conditions of uh, social, especially capitalist organization, our labor is something from which we become separated. So alienation for Marx is not just a psychological condition, obviously. Uh, it is a material condition in which the labor that I am supposedly most intimately related to nevertheless is something from which I'm alienated. Why? B precisely because it's bought and sold. And so I sell my labor in exchange for wages. I become, therefore, a wage slave, however materially comfortable I might be and my labor is something that no longer belongs to me. It belongs to whoever owns the means of production. So uh, the solution here, the implicit solution, is to close the gap between me and my labor. And in effect, uh, to heal the rift of alienation by re-engaging myself with what I do. In a way, uh, Marx's idea is actually rooted in an, a much older tradition, the, the idea of the vocation. Uh, the, the, I, the calling, uh, which naturally expresses the full uh, flowering or blossoming of my labor, is something which I, I must recapture. So to find my calling, again, might be, under this conception, uh, to reconnect with the labor that is otherwise alienated. Whether this can be done individually or must be done collectively is something that um, Marxists and neo-Marxists will debate. Um, I'm not going to pursue that right now, something we can return to. But the core idea of non-alienated labor is that the reconnection with labor will somehow bring me into a fuller and more comprehensive relationship to my, between myself and what I do. This might be captured by um, 
the sort of standard slogan, uh, if you do what you love, you never work a day in your life. And so this is a, a very optimistic, perhaps, vision of human happiness. But if you're engaged in something that you love to do, uh, there's no sense in which you are working. Uh, that is merely selling your labor for wages. You might get paid to do what you love, in which case you're blessed. Uh, but the key thing is that you do it because you love it. Third, <clears throat> traditional conception of, of human happiness. Uh, Abraham Maslow's well-known notion of the hierarchy of needs and the, the top of the hierarchy of needs being self-actualization. Uh, self-actualization in Maslow's uh, psychological conception of the self means transcending various levels of bare necessity in order to ascend to a condition where I am engaged with a kind of personal project of self-fulfillment. So at the lower level of the hierarchy of needs are things like uh, food and shelter, uh, and then somewhat higher, companionship, uh, sexual life, romantic life, uh, somewhat higher again, perhaps, uh, a sense of community. But highest of all, according to Maslow, is my own engagement with self and self. So my idea of what it means to be the best me I can be, uh, to actualize this conception uh, from the inside out, as it were. This is quite different from both Rousseau and Marx, obviously. Now we're dealing with a very 20th century, highly individualistic conception of self. Uh, and Maslow's notion of self-actualization, even though it's universalized across populations, is driven by my own sense of who I am in the best version of me. So again, um, a now quite traditional notion, especially uh, in the West, of what it means to be happy to actualize the self. And then finally, uh, and maybe most interestingly, most importantly, this will be the thread, I think, that runs through everything I say, Viktor Frankl's notion of meaning, uh, the, the idea that, that Frankl uh, derives from the most desperate conditions of the Second World War and, and the Holocaust, that the search for meaning itself is the meaning of life. So Frankl's notion is that uh, meaning is always being debated, but that it is the, the self-reflexive idea of being engaged in the search for meaning that provides meaning. And this is, a, again, a, an advance on the previous three notions. It is more subtle than, than the previous three, it seems to me. Still very individualistic, uh, in common with the previous one from uh, Maslow. But now we understand, uh, in Frankl's terms, the, the reflexiveness of the self upon itself. In fact, uh, you could argue that Frankl's notion of the self is completely um, anti-essentialist or post-essentialist, uh, that the self really is just the relationship between my, my idea of meaning and my search for meaning, to so this constant kind of renewing of the pursuit. And I, I choose this image, by the way, if you, it's just, Meaning, you probably all saw it, but um, the search for meaning is is visually represented here as something that you have to pick out. I'd rather see Seth. <laughs> right, right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so this is the background that uh, I want to post up, a uh, context. Uh, and now let us ask, what is the current condition? Do these ideas, any of the four, or some combination of the four, still have traction with us as we think about our lives? and the, the, the very idea of human happiness or of finding ourselves within a meaningful universe of existence. And I think the way to ask that question, the pressing way, is, is to ask this, uh, if you like, upstream question, uh, what is the difference between the human and the post-human? What I'm going to suggest is that uh, the crisis that we might characterize of our current moment is that we no longer know what the human is. All four of the previous traditional answers, and there are many others, these are just the highlights, presume to give us an account of what the human means. And in giving that account, give us a kind of normative program for full realization or complete realization of what it means to be human. I think, I argue, that we can no longer assume that we know what it means to be human. And that given this, it, we must put back into question any account of what it means to be happy or to even talk about the nature of meaning in the world. 
So uh, this is not, of course, unprecedented in, in human experience. Uh, there have been many moments of, of generalized cultural and individual crisis concerning the nature of the human. Uh, what I think is unprecedented and unique to our moment is the way in which our relationship to non uh, human biological aspects, machine aspects of the universe, uh, change the contours of the question. And that's what I'm going to suggest now. So, <clears throat> uh, th this in a way is, is the visual depiction of what I'm talking about. That the uh, traditional narrative of, of evolutionary development, which of course was, was open to question, uh, has now in a sense reached a different kind of conclusion, which might be in fact an inversion or a regression with respect to uh, the notion of the human. That we have gone through a stage of increasing our ability to wield tools and control and influence our environment. And while we continue to do that, as individuals we have now begun a kind of shrinking into a relationship of, of self to self which is imperfectly understood because of the, the uh, pervasiveness of our technological engagement. This is important because it might seem as though our uh, pervasive technological engagement is a, just a continuation of that developmental scheme. And many people have argued this. Uh, but I think this is I incorrect. I think it's, it's false to believe that we are simply extending a developmental narrative under current conditions. I think, in fact, we are regressing or inverting in ways that I will now try to explain. So. Um, this heroic image of what it means to be a human reflecting on human possibility, Rodin's thinker, uh, a, almost a cliche, I guess we could say, visual or, or a sculptural cliche of, of what it means to be engaged in the human uh, uh, possibility of reflection. And what we have to understand is that this has changed in our lifetimes. You know, uh, we are no longer merely biological. In fact, we, it's been some time since this was true. Uh, Donna Haraway's Cyborg Manifesto was published in the 1980s. Already in the 1980s, Haraway and others are noticing that we are now all cyborgs, cybernetic organisms. We are no longer entirely biological. We may pretend that we are biological, but we aren't. Uh, we are extended in space and time through non-biological mechanisms and systems uh, uh, to which we are intimately and inextricably related. And again, this may seem obvious, you know, uh, if you have a phone, um, you're not looking at them now, which I appreciate, thank you for your attention, uh, but most of you have phones somewhere about your person, uh, some of you have eyeglasses, some of you may have internalized uh, machines of various kinds. Even if, if, even if there's nothing on your body which is not biological, we are surrounded by the system. In fact, a complex of systems, uh, the, the, the Wi-Fi networks, uh, but also the com complex of systems that represent the notion of the city and our being in it. And this is all part of what it means to be cyborg. And we have to in confront this and stop pretending that the notions of what it means to be human that date from the 19th and uh, century and earlier are still relevant. They drastically are irrelevant and need to be updated. So one way to think about this is according to the notion of the uncanny valley. I don't know if this will be familiar, but um, here, here briefly, the uncanny valley <coughs> tracks a relationship between entities. And what it suggests, this was uh, uh, derived uh, by a, a Japanese computer programmer as he developed non-human entities to which humans were relating. And let me just briefly explain the axes. Uh, on, on the horizontal axis, we have the degree of human likeness. So it starts with very low human likeness and goes to higher degrees of human likeness. And on the vertical axis, it's called familiarity in this diagram, but a better word would be comfort or uh, uh, what's uh, I don't know, lack of anxiety, perhaps. Right? And here's, here's what's interesting. When we confront non-human entities that are very unlike us, we don't find them threatening or uh, producing of anxiety. 
So uh, the dotted line, by the way, is uh, moving. The, the, the solid line is still. So these are just examples. If we confront an industrial robot, an arm, robot arm, I mean, it is arm-like, but we don't have any trouble relating to it. We relate to it almost entirely as a tool because it is very unlike us. But as we move through other kinds of entities that are more and more like us, at first, our degree of comfort grows. So if we confront a humanoid robot or a stuffed animal, then we find these entities, uh, although clearly not human, nevertheless quite comfortable. And in fact, the more like us they appear to be, the more we can relate to them up to a point. And then this is the famous point of tipping into the uncanny valley. So when we find a humanoid robot that is too much like a human, but still recognizably not a human, and by the way, if you follow uh, developments in robotics, that's pretty much where we are in terms of humanoid robotics right now. Uh, quite sophisticated robots uh, being developed, uh, especially in, in East Asia, Sometimes they're pop singers, sometimes they are um, advertising mannequins. Uh, they're very human-like, but there's still something creepy about them. And that's the notion of the valley. So up to a point, the familiarity is comfortable, growing in comfort, in fact, and then it falls into a valley. And so here we see these, these um, values, these uh, quantitative values are somewhat arbitrary, um, but the examples are not. So uh, the still version of the uncanny valley is the corpse, the once animated human body, which is no longer alive, uh, and the moving version is the zombie. So the, once again, uh, non-human entity, which behaves very much like a human, except for the fact that you can't relate to it. And except insofar as it wants to eat your brains, uh, and that is the only relationship that you have. So this is deep into the uncanny valley. Now the, uh, the interesting thing is that we can swing out of the uncanny valley as we get closer and closer to a, a perfect identification between entities. This is a little misleading. It shouldn't say healthy person. It should say recognizably uh, human entity. Right, an entity that I can recognize as a fellow human. So if you look around right now and look at each other, you, you, or look at me, you're all looking at me, but um, if, if you wanted to look at each other, you could say to, you know, oh, here are some other entities that are not me. Uh, I'm not scared of them. They're not zombies. I mean, as far as I can tell, they're not corpses. Uh, they are, I don't want to say, healthy necessarily, but they're recognizably of the same entity category as myself. And so I'm okay with them. And presumably you're okay with each other and with me. Right? So there's no uncanniness here. But imagine if one of you was uh, slyly replaced by a robot or a zombie or a corpse. Right? In each of those cases, once we recognize that that was the case, we would be plunged back into a feeling of creepiness or discomfort profound discomfort, right? Notice that the valley goes below the line of merely neutral. We have a positive uh, distaste or uh, um, increased level of anxiety with respect to these other entities. Okay. With the zombie, I should say, the, the problem with the zombie is not really recognizing that it's uncanny. The problem is running away fast enough so that it doesn't eat your brains. But um, that's a practical matter. This is a philosophical account. Now. Um, here are some, some other examples on the same scale. Uh, again, industrial robot, no reaction. C-3PO, I see 3 po from the Star Wars franchise, is humanoid, but, but not human, so he's cute. Right. Uh, Michael Jackson, uh, this is a little unfair perhaps to Michael Jackson. If, if, you're, if you're a Michael Jackson fan like I am, you, you just have to confront this fact, but, but at the end of, of Michael Jackson's life, he had taken on a somewhat creepy demeanor because of the things that he had done to his body and the way he was presenting in the world. Right, so, and then uh, right up here, any, uh, this is, should be a spoiler alert, I guess, uh, if you are fans of Battlestar Galactica. Uh, the character Boomer, uh, sorry, I'm going to say this. So character Boomer is uh, a Cylon. That is to say, she is a non-human entity. But not only indistinguishable from other human entities by humans, but by herself. 
she doesn't even know herself that she's a non-human entity. Okay? At that point, what's the difference? Right? I mean, there may be Cylons here among us right now, I can't be sure, uh, but we all assume that each other is uh, the same kind of character or type as we are, right? because we don't distinguish. So the valley again holds, this is the interesting problem. Now, that's familiar territory. Here's territory that may be unfamiliar. Postulate for the moment that on the other side of this traditional uncanny valley, there is another structure of uncanniness that is a mirror image or, or a doppelganger of the first one. And here we, we get into the territory which I think is most significant for us today. Right? Yes, for the most part, we encounter other entities that are relevantly like us and we have no problem relating to them. There's no uncanniness. But increasingly, maybe rarely to start with, but I, I want to, to suggest increasingly as time goes on, we will un encounter human, apparently human entities that are relevantly different from us. In what way? Well, uh, they, may be, they may be transsexual. Uh, they may have more and more uh, obvious prosthetics. Many of the prosthetics I mentioned before, eyeglasses, these are, um, you know, not so uh, intrusive. But what if people are modifying their bodies in ways to enhance abilities, modifying their cognitive abilities. One possible way that humans can be different from each other is on the so-called spectrum of cognitive ability. So if you encounter someone who is autistic, for example, cognitively different, or uh, sometimes nowadays called cognoqueer, right? someone who is working in the same world as you, but using different conceptual tools such that their difference from you actually is uncomfortable. And so on, and so on, and so on. So um, this is, the, I think, this is merely a factual description of where we are right now, that we are on the verge of encountering many, many more transhuman entities. We may be, in fact, ourselves interested in pursuing transhuman possibilities. I'm not going to speculate about anybody in the room, but um, Maybe you are enhancing your cognitive abilities using technology or of a mechanical or pharmaceutical kind uh, now or in the future. Uh, maybe you are in the process of modifying your body so that your gender or sexual identity uh, shifts in terms of your self-presentation in the world, uh, and so on and so on. Right? We have all of the abilities, all of the means by which this can be accomplished. And so the range of the so-called normal is expanding all the time. For those of us who are, uh, if you like, conservative with respect to trans possibilities, this will feel very much as unsettling as all the things felt on the way to the identification of entities at the top of the valley. But here's the interesting thing. This, of course, I think is happening now. What we may be looking at as we go through this is that as the range of normal expands, sooner or later, we no longer have a problem uh, recognizing other entities not like us as being hmm, not so unsettling. Now, whether that's true or not is in some ways, importantly, a social and political matter, not one of technology. But te technology is the enabling condition of this happening. So if you think, for example, of uh, hmm, sort of genetic quirks, or um, uh, the kinds of things that are depicted in, in near future scenarios, uh, mutations, right? genetic mutations like the X-Men, for example. Uh, notice how in those apparently science fictional scenarios, the most significant features are the social and political ones. What happens to the mutants? Are they rounded up and put into to experimental uh, uh, prisons called laboratories? Are they allowed to live among us? Uh, do we recognize them as like us? Or if not like us, then we're okay with them not being like us? And so on. These are the questions of our moment right now. So uh, not only are we all cyborgs now, ourselves, but, but we're becoming more cyborg all the time as, as a human population on this planet. And unless and until we appreciate this, we won't be able to think through our own sense of what it means to live a meaningful life, let alone to think about the very traditional notion of happiness. 
Now, one of the uh, background facts about this is the, uh, the so-called singularity. And I mention this partly because uh, there's a lot of anxiety that is aroused simply by the fact of technology advancing as quickly as it has and is, is continuing to do. So the, the uh, so-called singularity is, um, has been speculated about by many theorists. Ray Kurzweil uh, is most famous, perhaps, but lots of others. And the idea is that uh, we are actually creating artificial intelligences which uh, are themselves outstripping or will outstrip human intelligence um, sooner or later and probably sooner. So uh, again, these, these are speculative numbers, but um, think about this. If, if human intellect can be said to have advanced over the course of time, this time, uh, um, maybe that's so. Let's, let's not say intellect, let's say perhaps human ability to, uh, to manipulate concepts. Human uh, cognitive ability has certainly advanced. Um, but it's been a slow ascent. Since about the, last, uh, the middle of the last century, we have created non-human cognitive manipulating machines, symbol manipulating uh, systems, which are usually called computers, but are uh, really algorithms. Right? We're talking about algorithms. We wrote the algorithms, but now the algorithms themselves can write further algorithms. So they, in fact, are advancing. And they're advancing at a much quicker rate right? than, than we are. This is simple calculus. Um, their, their curve of ascent is much steeper than ours. And so there is the, the distinct possibility that they will transcend or surpass our ability to manipulate symbols uh, as, as non-human algorithms very soon. Uh, so, I mean, 2000, mm, this could be, depends who you talk to, 2025, 2030, uh, 2035. And if, if you accept this possibility, the question is, what does it mean? Computer scientists and, and uh, advocates of artificial intelligence think it's all great. You know, um, the artificial intelligences will become our, our overlords, and we will be happy uh, to be serfs in a new global order uh, kind of cyborg medievalism, where the, the machines rule and we merely survive. Uh, and of course, there is a kind of a dichotomy here between um, the sort of the happy machine intelligence and the evil machine intelligence. Right? So uh, nobody knows what this is going. Is it going to be Skynet, who you know Skynet tries to eliminate all the humans, or is it going to be a sort of happy cooperative venture in which the artificial intelligences and the non-artificial ones, namely us, uh, get along in some fashion or other? We don't know the answer to that question. This this betrays, of course, a long-standing anxiety about our relationship to ourselves, right? to the machines that we have created and which we feel that we only incompletely control. And so, th I mean, I, I don't have to tell you that there's a long uh, narrative tradition of human-made machines which then outstrip human control and bend back in some kind of punitive or uh, genocidal manner. You know? I mean, think about this. The Terminator franchise is really a narrative of genocide. Skynet is eliminating humans because humans are of a different order of being than the artificial ones that Skynet operates. Now, what I want to say is, uh, let's not get too far ahead in terms of our anxieties, but let's recognize that Skynet is already here. And Skynet is here. And we already are part of Skynet. Skynet is um, the, the, uh, the way that your phone works, the way that applications dominate your lives, uh, the way that you communicate with each other using these mechanisms, that's Skynet already. And let's not think that this is science fiction. This is science fact. And we must take account of it. So um, here we are. And uh, I should say that uh, it's, it's certainly, despite this image, it's, not <laughs> it's by no means restricted to young women. Uh, every, everyone is uh, a slave, in a way, already of their phone. We think that we're not. This is the interesting feature. We think that when we're, we're in, walking down the street with our phones, that we're in control. But take a step back and look at yourself doing this and realize the possibility that you're not in control. That the notion of the individual, which those four conceptions I talked about earlier was premised upon, is being 
irreversibly altered by this material condition. This video won't run. Um, so I'm just going to explain it to you uh, and get this to go. Speaking of technology, the GIF will run. So um, this, this is just uh, a kind of humorous illustration of the point. These are uh, this is Peyton Manning and Eli Manning, who are two brothers, two American uh, quarterbacks in the National Football League. And they, they dress up in this ad uh, as, you know, whatever those guys are. Um, Douchebags is what we call them. Uh, but anyway, I don't know what the Croat um, version of douchebag is. <laughs> but, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, and what they're talking about is, is watching football on your phone. And the video clip that I wanted to show, but which, which Skynet won't let me show, uh, is they're making fun of a guy. They're walking down the streets of New Orleans here, and they're making fun of the guy who's talking on his phone. And they're saying, that guy is using his phone as a phone. You know, what a loser. He's using his phone as a phone. Because the point is now that you can watch football on your phone, you can do anything on your phone. Right? So this is where we are. Right? If Skynet is a reality, so is the walking dead. We are the walking dead. And I said before, well, we couldn't tell for sure if somebody here is a zombie. But in this metaphorical sense, anybody who is in this condition is a zombie. The difference is they're not trying to eat your brains, they're eating their own brains. This is the self-consumption of the brain by itself. And it's interesting that the, the, the actual uh, perambulation, you know, the way of walking, is itself a kind of zombie stagger. You know, they bump into people. Right? They just, they're, they're, they're no longer relating to other entities on the street because the relationship is here. And uh, you may have heard, uh, I think it's in... Lausanne or Geneva, uh, some urban planner has now installed traffic lights on the sidewalk rather than on stanchions above so that people will know what, when it's time to cross the street because otherwise, God forbid, they should have to look up and actually see that it's green now and they can walk. You know? So now it's now on the, you know. So. All right. Now, what are the consequences of this, if any? And here's where I'm, I'm going to continue the speculation. To do that, I want to take a step back. And let's think about the notion of upgrade anxiety as a general condition of the technological universe. And what I mean by that is that whenever we are re relating to a machine aspect of the world, there's always something better implied by it. So in part, the most obvious version of this would be planned obsolescence. So system one is meant to be surpassed by system two. And every model of any particular device is, by definition, only there as a placeholder for the superior, allegedly superior model, which is about to come later. Hence the whole structure of early adopters, uh, you know, late adopters, refuse next. This whole kind of narrative of how we upgrade is built into the very idea of technology. It, it often looks like it's... Uh, separate from that. Oh, you know, I simply want version 2.0 because it's better. But, but, but this is to make a mistake, right? You want version 2.0 because version 1.0, in a sense, demands to be replaced by version 2.0. That is the logic of technology. So the anxiety, I want to suggest, the anxiety we feel is actually a clue to our relationship to technology, to the idea of technology, that I need to get version 2.0. I need to get the new phone, because... But so does the profit. So, sorry? So does the profit. The profit also... Oh, sorry, absolutely. I mean, this, yeah, I haven't, I haven't talked about the capitalist preconditions of this, but obviously, yes. Yeah. But I want to say, this actually holds uh, even without the, the specific imperatives about, uh, of capitalism. Right? This is this something that holds independently because of the nature of technology itself. Right? And so we're constantly feeling this uh, pressure to upgrade, and when we fail to upgrade, a kind of diminishment or failure, which we internalize as individual. Okay. So I have a phone. The phone must have apps, and it ha must have many more apps. And in fact, I can, I can get to a point where what's sometimes called feature creep. Uh, you may have heard this term, feature creep, where adding new things at, at a certain point becomes self-defeating. 
And so this is the, you know, the Swiss Army knife, which cannot be used for anything because... Showing the, off. Yeah, showing off. But because it has too many features. But the imperative actually embraces this. So uh, some of you, I, I would be willing to bet, I won't force you to confess, but I bet some of you have on your phone apps that you have never used and which you may no longer remember having installed. Uh, and I think, you know, examine your own conscience on this question. Uh, but what does that indicate? At some point, you felt like you had to add the app to your phone, but it has no practical value. You have not used it. And nevertheless, there is this feeling that it should be there, or must be there. Um, in part, this <clears throat> is just uh, uh, capital conditions, uh, but I, I think it's deeper than that because of the way it, it sneaks inside our, our sense of ourselves. So this, this is, uh, in English, I want what I want when I want it. And I want what I want when I want it. Uh, the idea <clears throat> that there should be instant gratification of any particular desire. In fact, let's probe more deeply, that desire itself is the notion of being instantly gratified. That that is the conception of desire to which we are intimately wedded. Um, partly this, this now captures something, I think, characteristic of our moment. I don't know if these, these are kind of out of date now, but as hashtags, uh, if you, yeah. There's, there's the, the written out version. Um, YOLO, you only live once. FOMO, fear of missing out. Uh, these two imperatives that cut across each other, you only live once seems to be a more traditional idea of carpe diem, uh, seize the day, you know, live for, for the moment. Uh, and yet there's a certain, we have to acknowledge, anxiety about it. And so when you couple it with fear of missing out, which is that idea that everybody else is doing something and I'm not, which in a, a, a more secure moment we might think of as a merely adolescent anxiety actually is generalized culturally. All right, so let's return now to the four traditional conceptions and see what's happened under um, the uh, conditions that I've just described. The traditional notion of freedom becomes a kind of bogus idea of freedom. Right? Freedom to work within uh, an actually repressive social structure and um, social and, and economic structure. So I preserve my freedom in the form of, say, consumer choice. But this is, this is certainly not what Rousseau meant by freedom. And yet, it may be the only freedom that still makes sense. Non-alienated labor <clears throat> becomes, uh, well, the, the very idea of e even having a job. So in, in uh, I'm not sure it's true in, in Croatia, but in North America, uh, the most uh, quickly growing sector of, of the labor force is unpaid labor, interns. Right? Um, and people who are interns, unpaid interns, are happy to be unpaid interns because the alternative is not being an intern at all. You know, the alternative is certainly not being a paid employee. So internships become a kind of willing self-slavery uh, under these, these uh, contemporary economic conditions. And then the hierarchy of needs and self-actualization. Well, um, think about, here's, here's, here's the traditional Maslowian uh, hierarchy. So as you said, I said before, physiological, safety, um, relational, self-esteem, self-actualization. And now, um, perhaps it is the case that uh, if we don't have connectivity, mm -hmm. we can't have anything at all in terms of a sense of self. Now, this is very much a, a problem of the developed world, of course. Uh, but think about this, that, that it's harder and harder to imagine any kind of life, let alone a, a self-fulfilled, self-actualized life, without this baseline condition of connection, or as we call it. I want to call it enslavement, but that's my particular bias. And then finally, meaning, well, um, this may or may not capture uh, the question of, of the meaning. Um, the search for meaning is no longer for many people, maybe most people, a matter of returning to the best that has been thought and written about the human condition, but instead a kind of constant uh, uh, hyperlinking uh, from, from point to point, um, thinking that meaning will be discovered along the way. 
So um, let me now talk uh, about the happiness imperative as a specific problem or symptom of this upgrade anxiety under these technological conditions. The happiness imperative, and I'll go quickly through this because I think this will be familiar, is simply the idea that um, we're not allowed not to be happy. That uh, there is a strong bias against us that demands that we be happy. And if we fail to be happy, or if we feel like we're unhappy, and yet everyone else is happy, the failing is ours. That somehow we as individuals have failed to become properly who we are. And this has been going on for some time. I would actually say this, this imperative is really characteristic of modernity. Uh, but the specific version that I'm interested in right now as a postscript to earlier work is the one that's driven by upgrade anxiety. If I'm not happy now, and I feel that that's a personal failure, maybe if I install the new app, I will be happy. Maybe if I add the feature, that will be the thing that allays my anxiety about being happy. I will have fulfilled the imperative. Um, and this, this won't run either. This is a famous scene from, from uh, Annie Hall. Uh, that's the video that won't run, because Skynet says so. Uh, they're there again. Um, some of you may recall the scene. Woody Allen's character, L.V. Singer, has just come from his therapist. And he's, he's desperately trying to understand how it can be possible to be happy, because he's so deeply unhappy. And so he stops this couple on the street. And that, that's Sybil Shepherd, by the way, who went on to, to be quite famous in Moonlighting and other things. Uh, and he says, you, you two look like a happy couple. What's the secret of your happiness? And, and the guy says, uh, well, I'm, I'm really stupid and I have no original thoughts. <laughs> and, and then she says, and I'm exactly the same way. <laughs> and so this, this is the, uh, the Woody Allen version of, of the happiness imperative, is that uh, the more you think, the more you realize that the happiness imperative is a kind of self-defeating uh, end game. Right? And uh, to illustrate this further, here's, here's uh, I promised the other night to talk about The Simpsons, and uh, I'll do it again briefly. In this famous episode of The Simpsons, uh, Homer Simpson discovers a complicated series of events that he has a crayon in his brain. It's a crayon. And uh, as a child, he had taken a box of crayons and stuffed them all up his nose. And then he sneezed, and they all came out except this one. So the one lodged in his brain. And it, it's a result of this crayon being lodged in his brain that Homer is as dumb as he is. So they, they have the crayon removed. And Homer is transformed. <laughs> so uh, now he dresses in a different way. He wears these, these sort of nerdy sweater vests, you know, V-neck sweater vests, little necktie. Uh, and he's tossing off the Rubik's cubes like, like potato chips that he used to eat. You know. And among other things, he has an improved relationship with his daughter, Lisa, because Lisa is the smart one in the family, as I'm sure you all know The Simpsons. But when he goes to talk to Lisa, he says what he's noticed with the crayon removed from his brain is that he's no longer happy, because now he thinks too much about things. Now the, the happiness imperative is one that he has begun to question. And he's gone to Hollywood movies, for example, and he can't get over the fact that they're full of plot holes and implausible narrative. Uh, he starts to take seriously his job at the nuclear power plant in Springfield as a safety officer, and he blows the whistle on violations, and all of the uh, fellow employees and management hate him, and so on. So now that he has intelligence, he has sacrificed the gift of happiness. And this captures the very same idea as the Woody Allen thing. And uh, so he goes to Lisa and, he, and, and explains this problem. And Lisa pulls out this graph and says, this is the relationship, inverse relationship between happiness and intelligence. <clears throat> and he asks, Homer asks Lisa how she copes being a smart person in a dumb culture, dumb world. And she says, I make a lot of graphs. <laughs> uh, and, then, and then she also says, Tai Chi and Chai Tea. <laughs> These are her coping mechanisms. Um, Homer, Homer, by contrast, can't cope. So he goes to mow the bartender, who uh, doubles as a surgeon, and has the crayon reinserted in his nose. Okay. There's the little hammer. Uh, so Mo, Mo takes the crayon, actually puts two crayons in for good measure, so that Homer can return to his previous condition of being happy but stupid. Now, the 
the, the sort of dark overtones of the story is that dumb Homer does not remember his episode as smart Homer. Mm -hmm. So when he has the crayons reintroduced into his brain, his memories of having been smart Homer are obliterated. And this is, in effect, uh, a, a suicide. Right? This is the suicide of smart Homer, deciding that he can no longer tolerate his time in the world as a smart person, uh, so returning to a condition. But it's not really a return. It is an obliteration of one form of life and, and continuation of another. The body of Homer is the same, but the mind is, is not continuous. Uh, so this, this, I mean, you probably never thought that there was a suicide depicted on The Simpsons, but I'm here to tell you that this is a suicide, in effect, and this is what, what dumb Homer uh, really is, the legacy of smart Homer's self-obliteration, uh, self-murder. Now, uh, I don't think it's true what, what Lisa says about the inverse relationship between intelligence and happiness. But I do think it's true that we don't think about happiness critically enough. And I just wanted this, you don't have to look at all the data here, but uh, this is a, a, a bunch of findings about people reporting their own degree of happiness. And as you can see, perhaps, um, health is important to a certain percentage, relationships to a much larger percentage, children to a large percentage. Surprising, perhaps, uh, two-thirds of people count having pets as a key component of their being happy. So those of you who don't have pets, consider it if you want to be more happy. Or some crayons. Or, you know, the, crayon, the crayons are the instant solution to 100%. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, the other thing that's significant in the data is uh, what's sometimes called the, the happiness U-curve. Uh, people are most happy when they're young or older. And right around 50, yeah, yeah me too, uh, this, this is the bottom, this is the trough of happiness. <laughs> the speculation, of course, is, is obvious because when you're, even though you're struggling at, at an earlier age, uh, the struggles all have meaning, right? Because uh, uh, up to the point, you'll notice that it goes down in this. So in your 20s and 30s, you might be quite unhappy because things are uncertain, your, your future career, your relationships, but you're building something. And, uh, you know, for typical, this is a Western or developed world kind of narrative. You, you uh, establish a relationship, you maybe buy a house, you have a career, you have children. And then after that, there is a kind of decline. It's not, it's not a flat line, right? It's a decline because people feel hollowed out uh, in that later stage of life. What is my life for? I've been obeying all the imperatives of happiness. And now that I have achieved them, I no longer know what I'm here for. This, of course, the reason it swings up on the other side is I'm just happy to be alive <laughs> after a certain point. Right. So that, that's, I mean, this is not a qualitatively distinct, right? It's just self-reported happiness. But if you hang on past 60, it's like, you know, okay, I'm, I'm glad just to, to have one more day. So the data suggests that um, we need to think, even in our own self-reporting about happiness, uh, why we have no control over our sense of this narrative. Right? One might assume according to the philosophical accounts, that the curve would, would be constantly up. But in fact, it's not, at least as people report. And I think that is clear empirical evidence that the happiness imperative is not only dominating, but is misunderstood by individuals. Because we can't actually get ourselves in a condition of refusing the imperative. Uh, this is another video that doesn't run, uh, so I, I'm not even going to talk about it, except I, I, I will say, if anybody, does anybody recognize this? This is an ad for a series called Man Seeking Woman. I don't know if it plays on television. Yeah. Um, in, in the ad, the, this is the main character. He's a young man in, in Los Angeles seeking you know, love and, and stability. And as you watch him in the ad, he's sitting on his couch. And then later, he's sitting at his, his uh, desk in a cubicle. And he's standing next to a, a food truck. And he's standing at a urinal in a, in, a, in a men's room. And each time, you're just watching it. And he's flung to the side. And then they cut away, and they show two, two women looking at his profile on Tinder. Right? And they're you know, swiping left like this. And as they swipe left, he gets thrown. You know? And what I love about this is that um, th this is, in, in a way, emblematic of our relationship to technology and happiness. So here he is. He's put himself out as a person in a profile. 
and he's being rejected. And of course, in real life, he doesn't feel the rejection. But the rejection, nevertheless, is real because it's a, you know, some opportunity, some connection that isn't being made. He is being flipped aside with, without any, uh, so any kind of consideration whatsoever. So to physicalize it in this way actually is really powerful because that, that's what it really is, even though physically we're not thrown to the side each time. So um, to conclude on uh, this point, Really, the, the traditional philosophical analysis is, is unchanged by the details that I've been showing here if we go back far enough. But we have to go back past the traditional notions that I started with, the ones that belong to modernity. And we have to return to a, a much more basic question about ourselves, which is, uh, why are we here? Uh, to ask this question is, if we do it properly, to cut through all of the things I think, I, I, I like to think, uh, that count against it or cut, cut against it. Uh, but it's, it's not easy. And so um, it freaks us out. <laughs> Just like this. <laughs> uh, it's, it's difficult to ask this question of why. It's difficult to refuse the happiness imperative. And most of us are not prepared to put crayons in our brain to, to let ourselves off the hook uh, because we recognize that the death of smart Homer is uh, a, a kind of self-murder, and we don't, we don't want to do that. So we're left with um, a quandary. Now, I'm biased. I think philosophy or philosophical reflection is the right way to think through these conditions. But I, I will ask you to um, push back on this if you like. And I'm going to simply conclude by saying that philosophy is not here to be understood as uh, a kind of consolation. Uh, this is a uh, famous depiction of Boethius. There's Boethius there, uh, the Stoic philosopher who, uh, condemned to death, wrote the classic tract, The Consolation of Philosophy. Uh, philosophy, Boethius said, came to him in the guise of a woman, a goddess, and she soothed his pain. Uh, this reveals that he is not a, a, a sufficient Stoic uh, because there is no consolation. There's no consolation from the world and there's no consolation from philosophy. Uh, wisdom, maybe, but wisdom and consolation are not the same thing. We are not going to be made to feel better by engaging in philosophical reflection. On the contrary, <clears throat> we're going to find, uh, as in the classical depiction of Sisyphus, uh, that the battle is always uphill and is always, in some important sense, pointless. Pointless in this sense that we cannot underwrite it or guarantee it according to something external to ourselves. There is no meaning except the meaning that we invest into the project of this uphill battle. I think it was ever thus. And I think that uh, though I have talked about, here's how you can depict uh, Sisyphus for your desktop if you like. And next time you see an orange, just get a peanut and some paper clips and make a little Sisyphus um, to remind yourself that uh, the technological details actually have changed us. We are in a different condition now than we have been 100 years ago, even 20 years ago. But the, the basic imperative is to refuse the happiness imperative and ask the difficult questions that will actually make us unhappy, offer us no consolation, but because that is the only way, the one and only way, that we create meaning. Um, and then finally, uh, well, you can't even see it. This is another video uh, of uh, a model of Sisyphus made out of Lego. And I, it's like, I love the Lego, just this constant churning of, of the Lego wheels, um, because that's what it is to be human. I also think it is what it will be to be post-human, and each of us in, is engaged in that project. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>